We want to greet everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, turn to the 15th chapter of John. We've been talking about how God's word produces fruit, and, uh, which basically means that God's word will bring about a change in our lives. Not only will that change come, but the, those changes will grow. Now, as we explained before, fruit is something that grows. It is something that is planted. There's a seed that is planted, and from that seed being nurtured and watered and having the correct nutrients in the ground that it is planted in, then it would cause that seed to grow and produce fruit. And here's the thing about fruit. When, when, a, when a, the seed is planted and the, the, the tree or the plant begins to grow, it produces several fruit. On, from that one particular seed. And of course, when the fruit has become full grown, on the inside of that fruit is more seed, and, and then those seeds are also planted. And so when we think about fruit, the nature of it is to multiply. You can have one orange or one apple, and in that one orange or one apple is several seeds, where, you know, that will produce trees or, you know, or other plants. And so that is the nature of God's word. It's, it is not only to produce fruit, but to multiply those fruits, to multiply in our lives. And so when we're talking about producing fruit, we're talking about producing the works of God and the character of God in our lives. Uh, Jesus said that the works that I do, greater works shall you do. You see, and so what does he mean by greater? Does he mean greater as in, in um, the quality? No, because... Jesus raised the dead and we know that they are, you know, and he saved people. And so those works, you can't, you know, you can't do greater. But what is he talking about when he say greater? He's saying more, more works shall you do. In other words, he was his ministry uh, spanned for a few years here on this earth. And when he left, he left us to continue that work. And so and it was only one of him. And so since as many of us, there should be greater works or more works that's being done in our lives through uh, because of him and through our lives. And so this is what we're talking about when we're talking about God's word produces fruit is that it should produce the same thing that it produced in the life of Jesus Christ, which is people being saved, their lives being changed, not only being saved, but their lives being changed. That once they are saved, they're no longer the same person. When someone gets saved, uh, what happens is Jesus Christ, he puts his spirit in them. God puts his spirit in them so that they will know the difference from right from wrong, right and wrong. And also they are able to make a decision before we get saved. A lot of times um, we are slaves to sin and we are slaves to sin once we're when we're not saved, which means that our sin nature is what has control over us because there is no other nature on the inside of us. You know, the only nature we have when we're born is a sin nature. And so we're slaves to that nature. Now, once we get saved and the Holy Spirit has been given to us, now we have the ability to overcome that sin nature. Whereas before, we don't have the ability to overcome the sin nature because there is no power in our own nature. But once the Holy Spirit is given to us, now we have the ability to, to make choices. Now we have the ability to overcome sin. And the way we do it is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is watered by the word of God. So we're going to continue on with our lesson on God's word produces fruit. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to the 15th chapter of John. And we're going to start reading. And here, Jesus Christ, he gives some secrets to um, how we're going to produce fruit. And what is, the, what is the secret of us producing fruit? Not just God's word, but what is a divine secret that is given? Let's go ahead and start reading at verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Now, Jesus Christ, he lets us know that he is the true vine. Now, what is he talking about when he say true vine? What is a true vine? A true vine, what he's, what he's saying is he is the main vine. If you, if you want to think about it in this way, if you look at a tree, uh, you know that there's a, a, a tree has several branches. But there is one particular true vine for that tree, and that's the one that's out of the ground. That's the, that's the particular main, I guess, branch or what you could call it, a uh, stump that's coming out of the ground. Of course, it goes vertical. You know, it goes vertical from the ground on up into the air, to the sky. And then you have branches that are extended horizontally out of that tree for the most part. 
And so what Jesus is saying is that I am the true vine. I am the main stump that everything else is coming out of. Now, if you don't have a true vine, then you don't have anything else. All of the other branches that comes out of that stump or out of that true vine, out of that main stump there, uh, they are attached to the main stump. Now, as soon as they have been cut off, there is no more life in them. You can cut a branch off and it won't, you can, and you can plant it in the ground. It won't bear any fruit because it has to be attached to a true vine. It is the true vine or it is the main stump, I guess you could say, that who's, who's connected to the roots. And of course, those roots go down into the ground and their job is to find water and nutrients. And so that is the purpose of the true vine now. So Jesus Christ is letting it be known what part of that tree he is or what part of the vine he is. He is the true vine. Okay, and it says that his father is the husbandman. What does that mean? His father is the farmer. In other words, his father is the one that dresses it, that takes care of it. Okay, let's go ahead and keep reading. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, in this one scripture is, is uh, 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 um, uh, uh, a main truth that we need to get a hold of. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit. Now that means that you can be a part of the body of Christ and still not bear fruit. And that's what he's saying there. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Who does? God does. Why? Because if you, if you look at a tree and you have, any farmer know this, if you have a tree that you've planted, a, a fruit tree, and you see that there are several branches on that tree that's bearing fruit. In other words, whether it's apples or oranges or peaches or whatever. You see that that has got... Most of the branches in that tree that's bearing fruit, but you have two or three of them that's not bearing fruit, those branches are still alive and they're eaten and taken away from the branches that are bearing fruit, you see. And so when we, in the body of Christ, when we're not bearing fruit, what we're doing is we're sucking the life out of the rest of the branches that are. And so here, the way that the husbandman or God deals with it is he removes them. Why? Because his will is that we bear fruit and he doesn't want what is the use of us. And I've often said this as a minister. Uh, if I ever decide to stop preaching, I don't believe I'd live another month after that, because what is my purpose besides doing what God's will is for my life? And, I, you know, sometimes we don't look at it that way. As uh, especially as when we were unbelievers, we thought that we were just living our own lives and that we own the world and we decide when we're going to die and we decide what's going to go on in our life. And we have no idea most of the time until we get saved. We have no idea just how out of control we are of our own lives, just how much God controls our life as far as waking us up at any time. He can allow something to happen. And so he's the one that watches over us. And so I'm convinced that. We as people, we really need to get a hold on, on, on that. And we really need to get a grasp on this idea that we are to bear fruit for the Lord. That is our purpose for being in this world is to bear fruit. And anytime we're not bearing fruit, then, of course, we have to check ourselves and look and see what it is that's causing uh, us not to bear fruit. And so he says that every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. And so what does that mean? It means that we should never be satisfied just because we're bearing some fruit. And oftentimes what happens is in, in uh, our Christian walk is we, the Lord start using us just a little bit and we get overexcited and we, we think that that's all of it. You know, uh, we should never be, and I want us to get this very clearly, we should never be satisfied as Christians in what God is doing through us. We should always, in other words, we should always want more of God. We should always feel like there is more that we can do for the kingdom of God. And, you know, when we have that mindset, then we open ourselves up to be used more by the Lord. You know, we should never think, oh, thank you, God, I'm praying for the sick and they're recovering. And so that's what my, that's where it's going to end for me. We should always want to do more for God. We should always want to bear more fruit for God. But I'm going to tell you why. Uh, one reason that many Christians get satisfied and don't want to go any further than they are in the Lord is what we read about here in this verse here. It says, and let's, let's read this carefully. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, what does that mean? That when we're bearing fruit, if we really got a hunger for the Lord 
and God knows that that hunger is there, he's going to purge us so that we can bring forth more fruit. What does that word purge mean? It means that you take off the stuff that's not, been, that's not profitable to that particular branch. Uh, you know, branches, they have little twigs that comes out of them, and you take those things out that's, that fruit is not hanging on so that the fruit that is there can bring forth more fruit, and so that branch can bring forth more fruit. So you have to take off those little twigs off of those branches that's not uh, healthy. In fact, those branches can end up eating up uh, the, the branch. Those, those little twigs can end up causing more damage than they can good for that particular branch. And so what does he mean when he says he purges it? It means that that's, that that's another word for cleansing. That's another word for removing things that shouldn't be there. And oftentimes we as Christians, we want to bring forth fruit, but we don't want to go through that purging process because it, it's a process that's not comfortable. Uh, when the Lord purges us, sometimes he puts us around, around people that will rub us, what we consider, rub us the wrong way because what is it it's designed to do is designed to show us what's on the inside of us. You cannot grow in the Lord or be purged in the Lord to do the things that he wants you to do if you are not aware of what's on the inside of you. How can you ask for forgiveness and how can God cleanse you if you don't know that you need to be cleansed or if you think that you have arrived already? And so the purpose of purging is to show us. To, to cleanse us, but we have to be shown what is on the inside of us. We have to be shown the ugly things that we don't want to face up to sometimes. And we all have those things, you know, those things in our lives that we don't want in our life, those things that we want to do better in, we all have those things. But for us to know those things, that means that we have to be put in uncomfortable situations. Amen. That means that we have to, somebody's going to have to rub us the wrong way. Things are going to have to be said to us that's going to hurt our feelings. Things, in other words, it, it, life is not going to be a perfect life. It's not going to be something uh, that we just skip through. It's, it's going to be something we're going to be challenged. And our response to those challenges and our response to those things that make us uncomfortable will clearly show us what's on the inside of us. And, you know, I, I call them tests, you know. The, the way a school system or a teacher will know whether or not you are ready to pass to the next level is they have to test you. And you cannot pass a test if you don't know the answers or if those answers already, the aren't already in you, you see. You can't guess in, in the things of God. And so what does that mean? It means that for God to, for us to know where we are in the kingdom of God and where our growth have taken place, we have to be tested in life situations, in everyday life, you know, through whether it's on our job, or in our homes, there are going to be times when we are going to be tested. Now, in school, when you're in the seventh grade, you sh and when you've passed the seventh grade, you should know more than what you knew when you were in the sixth grade. And you should know more than what you knew when you were in the fifth grade. Other than that, why? Because as you go through, li as you go through school and you pass the sixth grade, then what's the purpose of you going to the seventh grade is for you to learn more and for you to grow and to prepare you to enter into the next level, into the next grade. And so what purging does is it shows us where we are in God. It shows us and it takes away those things that will hinder us from being able to bear more fruit. And so we have to be willing and we have to be willing, able and not only able, but willing to go through the tests. We have to be willing to go through those things so that uh, we can be purged and so that we can continue to bear fruit. And like I said, when we're talking about purging, we're talking about things of the flesh. Now, we're naturally flesh and we have our own personalities. We have those things that we were born with, our personalities, whether it's our attitudes and likes or dislikes or whatever. We have those things already embedded in us. And since they have become so much a part of our being, when God begins to purge or peel those things back from our lives, they become uncomfortable. Amen. And sometimes we hear people, you know, say, well, that's just me. That's just the way I am. And but that doesn't cut it in the things of God, because if, if you, you know, people will say, well, I, I was created this way. This is just my personality. This is just me. It doesn't mean that God excuses that just uh, excuses it just because it's you. 
That's the whole point of being saved. So he can change you and being born again. So that he can change your old nature to the new nature, to his nature. And that purging thing, that's a thing that people don't want to go through. We, you know, when you, when you ask God to grow, and when you sincerely want to grow in the Lord, you can prepare for war. You can prepare for a battle. And it's not just the enemy. It's God allowing it so that you can see where you are. So that we can see where we are in this life. So we can see the areas that we need to grow in. Amen. I have come to learn in, in uh, my Christian walk that God, whenever we ask God for help, he will help us. He will. You know, if we see something in our lives that not pleasing to him, and we say, Lord, please help me in that area. I need to grow in that area. If we will be sincere, you know what? He will help us. But at the same time, he will allow us to go through things, not only to show us what we need help in, but also to show us how we've grown. To show us, okay, you remember last year you responded this way, or you remember last week or last month or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is the way you responded when you were in this situation. So now you see that you've responded this way. So I want you to see the growth process. What is the point? You know, we've all been in school and we've all uh, remember taking tests and our teacher may draw, a, a, you know, may put an A plus on our paper or A or B minus or whatever and put a smiley face on side of that. What is the point of that? In showing you that you've grown. In other words, in showing you you've passed the test. Why? Because that will encourage you to keep learning and to keep growing. Amen. And so God not only purges us and, and uh, so that we can bring forth more fruit, but he also shows us and he has a way of showing us, OK, you've grown in this area. Why? So that that can encourage us so that we can continue to grow so that we can see that there is a change. There is a, a, a real change that takes place in our lives. And sometimes we may feel like it's not coming fast enough. Sometimes we may feel like, you know, because the growth process may be a slow one, we may feel like, and the devil is, does a good job of making us feel like, well, you're not growing at all. But God allows us to see that growth by uh, allowing us to be challenged and seeing the, the responses that we have to those challenges and allowing us to see uh, the differences in the way that we react. And not only that, but in the way that those things affect us. Okay, let us go ahead and uh, keep reading. Verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You see that? Now you see how when the word is mentioned, it talks about cleansing. In several scriptures, we see that, how the word and clean comes hand in hand. And that is the purpose of God's word. It produces fruit. It cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It's, it's profitable for reproof. For, you know, and all of these things that we listed in the previous teaching, those things is profitable for. So the word of God really does change us. The word of God, when it sinks down in us, it really does changes us. You know, it's just like a sponge, as we as we mentioned before, you put a sponge in a bucket of water. It's going to soak up that water. So how can you, you know, when you place yourself in the word of God, that's what you're going to soak up. And so when you rend when you wring a sponge out and rinse it out and tighten you know, uh, up on it, that is what it's going to come out of. It is water, pure water. And that is what should come out of us as the word of God. That is what we're supposed to produce. So we're clean by the word. Go ahead and keep reading. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. So again, if we stated before earlier on in this message, if you cut a branch off of a tree, that you don't have to worry about that branch bearing any, any fruit. Because it is because of the root of that tree, or in other words, because of the true vine of that tree, that branch bring forth fruit. So if you cut a branch off of a tree, it's going to wither away and die. You cannot, a branch can't bring forth fruit of its own. You can cut a branch off, I don't care how many uh, leaves it have on it, or how much fruit it have on it at the time. If you cut it off, the fruit is going to die. It's not in the fruit that's growing. If it's growing, it's going it's not going to continue to grow. Even if you cut that branch off and stick it in the ground and bury it in the ground, it will not produce fruit. It's just going to continue to die. And so many people, they get started in God and some kind of way they just they just move out of God's will and they think that they're just going to continue to bring forth fruit. And they get to thinking that it's them and, you know, it's all about them. And especially when they get to comparing themselves to other branches. And what happens is when they get when they remove themselves from that true vine, then no longer can they bring forth fruit. And so here's the thing that we have to ask ourselves. If 
we're not producing fruit, could it be because we're really not attached or could it be because we're not abiding in the true vine? Amen. If we're not bringing forth fruit, there has to be a reason behind it. And part of that reason could be because we're not uh, abiding in, the, in Jesus Christ. If we abide in Jesus Christ, we're going to bring forth fruit. And that's, that's made clear by this scripture here. Go ahead and keep reading. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And that is a scripture to help to humble us. Jesus Christ Amen. is the true vine. And he's letting us know you can do anything without me. So that right there should be our attitude and prayer when we come to the Lord. And that right there removes, to me, if we are take that scripture to heart, it removes any pride that we may have in ourselves. Amen. That without him, we can do nothing. And that should be our attitude and prayer towards the Lord. Lord, without you, I can do nothing. So have your way with me. Whatever you want to use me to do, do it for your glory. Because it's you anyway. You see, it takes the attention off of the branches. It takes the attention off of the branches. And it puts the attention on the true vine, which is Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> it helps us to keep things in its proper perspective. In other words, God, if I, if I know without a doubt that all I am is a branch and that I can do nothing without him, it keeps me from being arrogant. It keeps me from being lifted up in pride. It keeps me wanting to be attached to him because, you know, nobody, when, when you plant a, a tree and when you plant, plant a, 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 a plant or something like that, you don't water the branches. You see, you water the vine. You water the root of the tree. And be why? Because it's the root of the tree that provides the nutrients to the, everything else. And so all glory, in other words, it goes to God. It goes to the true vine, the one that's responsible for the branches to bring forth fruit. We just have to make sure that our attitudes are right, that our heart is right when it comes to bearing fruit. One of the reasons why um, people don't bear fruit is because of their attitude, because their heart is not right. You know, God want to use us to do great and mighty things in this world. But here's the thing. He won't share his glory with anybody. So if you have a branch who has a big mouth who feel like, oh, this is me, God. I'm the one that's doing this. I'm the big dog. I'm the one that's planted in the ground. I'm the one that's, you know, of course, God already knows our attitudes. He already knows what's on the inside of us. And so we have to make sure that whenever we pray to the Lord, that we're praying with a sincere heart. Mm -hmm. You know, my thinking is there are a lot of people that need to be touched from by God. And God will use people to do that. There are a lot of people who are sick who need to be prayed for. But here's the thing, when we are asking God for those things, and when we're, when we're asking God to heal somebody, are we in a position, are we have, do we have the mindset to give God the glory once that healing takes place? Amen. Do we have the mindset to do that? I, I was listening to that message the other day, uh, and uh, I heard a woman standing before a minister, and this minister was about to pray for her. And she was saying how the Lord had shown him uh, had shown her that she should come to his meeting to be prayed for because there was another minister who had told her that she had uh, different things wrong with her, her heart trouble and her heart was swelled up uh, three times its normal size and and so uh, so she but you know it was a misdiagnosis there was the, the minister the first minister was wrong and so the woman the Lord showed the woman that she should go to this other minister to be prayed for and so when she went to this other minister she was standing before him and uh, the minister told her, you went to another minister and that minister misdiagnosed you. And uh, so he told the woman what was wrong with her and, you know, prayed for her and she was healed. And so while he, after he was praying for the woman, the woman said, well, I've seen uh, great miracles happen in this man's ministry. And she called the man by name, you know, and uh, and so the minister, of course, he he directed the attention back to the Lord. And he, his response was. Where the Lord is wonderful, and the Lord is merciful. In other words, this woman was trying to give credit to the minister that was standing in front of her. But what the minister did was directed her back to the Lord, which is why the minister, this particular minister, he had those kind of fruits operating in his ministry was because whenever somebody tried to say how great he was, 
he always said how great God was. And that is how we'll bear fruit. If we, you know, if, if you want to bear fruit, then you give God the glory for the fruit that you're bearing. And he will purge you and continue to purge you so that you can bring forth more fruit. There is no place for pride in the things of God. And pride will keep us. If, if, we take any, if we could try to take any kind of glory from God, pride will keep us from being able to bear the fruit that God wants us to bear for his life. So here's one thing that we can ask ourselves, especially in, in the, in when we're talking about the healing ministry or any of the gifts that God may give us, uh, especially when we're talking about praying for the sick. Are we willing, you know, do we feel like we have to be present for somebody to be healed when we pray for them? for the purpose of being there so that people can look at us and see we're the ones that have laid hands on them. Or are we willing to say, okay, Lord, there is no distance in the spiritual realm. And you don't, this person, Lord, that person don't have to know that I'm praying for them. I just want you to heal them. I just want them to be made whole. You know, that to me, that is a test, a test for me personally. And it should be a test for all of us. Are we willing to move ourselves out of the way to where the person don't even have to know that we're praying for them. And they can, they, it may be our prayer that God hears to heal them, but do we have to shout it out and, and, and let it ring out and blow the trumpet? In other words, what the scripture says, do we have to blow the trumpet to, to make it look like we're something? To make it look like, okay, I was there. I'm the one that laid hands on them. They got healed under my ministry, you see? And so God knows all these things, and we ourselves, we should have tests. You know, we know what we deal with in our own lives. We know the way that God uses us. And we should have questions that we ask ourselves to kind of test us to see where we are in this walk. You know, when it comes to bearing, to bearing fruit. You know, with me, it may be the healing ministry and, and things like that. With you, it may be some, something else. But in any case, we should have questions that we ask ourselves to make sure that pride haven't snuck in. To make sure that our motives are right. You know, to make sure of these, of these things, to make sure of them. And so, uh, in fact, we see that even in Jesus' life when the man came to him about his servant being sick. You know, Jesus said, go, go thy way. You know, your servant is made whole. In other words, Jesus didn't have to go and show up at the man's house and make some big announcement. Hey, I'm the son of God is here and everything going to be all right. You know, he didn't do that. He just spoke the word and it was done. He didn't have to show up because he was, in fact, you even see a lot of times when Jesus did miracles, he would tell them, go and tell no man. And of course, they, you know, you being excited about receiving a miracle, they're going to go and spread it out. But Jesus wasn't here to glorify himself. He was here to glorify God, which is why he was able to go to the cross, because if he was here to glorify himself, he would not have went to the cross. You see, he, so his will had to be moved out of the way to do God's will. And that is what we, and, and because of that, he was able to bear fruit for the God himself. And so that is how we're able to bear fruit. If we move our own will out of the way, if we move our own pride out of the way, out of the way, if we move our own flesh out of the way and get all of these impurities and all of these bad thoughts and imaginations, get those things out of the way, then we can bear fruit. Okay. Let us go ahead and keep reading. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. That's if you don't abide in him, see? Now, God's will is that we abide in him. What does that mean? We abide in his word. If we read, uh, again, we'll mention this. We read in the first chapter of the, book, of the same book here that in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. So what is Jesus Christ when he's saying... What is Jesus Christ saying if you abide in me? He's talking about if you abide in my word. Why? Because that's, that is him. It's one and the same. Go ahead and keep reading. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. You see that? So when, if we're asking what we will and it's not done unto us, then why is that? Maybe because we're not abiding in him. See, when we abide in Jesus Christ, we know his will. And so we're going to ask things that are, are according to his will. But when we're not abiding in him and we're trying to just please ourselves, then we will ask about, we'll ask for things that's not according to God's will. In fact, we, we read about that in the book of James, that a lot of times our prayers aren't answered because 
we're asking things amiss so that we can consume upon our lust. In other words, we're asking things that's going to appeal to our flesh, has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Now, don't get me wrong. God wants us to enjoy life. But God knows very well that there are some things that we can ask for that will cause us to, to go astray from him. And so whenever we're asking for those things, God won't grant those things. We may go out and like my granddaddy used to say, oh, my old granddaddy he used to say that you have to watch out for people because sometimes they'll answer their own prayer. In other words, they'll ask God for something and then they'll go out and make it happen themselves and think that God is the one that's doing it. No, it's you that's doing it. And since because and since you're so self-willed, God will allow you to do it. And we read about that very clearly in the book of Numbers uh, talking about the prophet Balaam. God had already answered him and told him, don't go with the king. Uh, uh, you know, Balak, don't go with him. But uh, he was just, he was determined in his mind to g just go. And so what happened? He kept inquiring of God. God, what do you want me to do? Every time this king would come back with something better. If you if you curse the people of God, then I'll give you this. If you curse the people of God, I'll give you that. And every time he came back with something better. And so this king, so Balaam, the prophet, who was a real prophet of God, he kept asking God, God, can I do this? And finally, God said, yeah, go ahead and go. But as he went along the way, death was waiting for him. His own death was waiting for him. You know, the angel of God was standing there with a sword, swinging it back and forth, ready to kill him. So it shows us that when we have our own purpose and when we have our own designs and our own minds made up, God will allow you to walk that path because God is not going to put you in a headlock and make you do anything that you should do. Amen. That's why we can't be self-willed in this thing. We have to be willing to abide in him. What was Balaam's problem? He wasn't willing to abide in the word that God had already given him. And so he was asking for something that was against God's will. But why? Because of his own fleshly lust. He wanted that power. He wanted to be honored. He wanted the riches that the king was offering him. And so we have to be careful. And see, because of that, he became unfruitful. And if you keep reading, you see that Balaam died later on before his time. Why? Because every branch that abideth not in God is taken away, taken away, and is cast forth in the fire. And that's what happened to us when we get self-willed. When we get to the point where we, you know, no longer wanting to bear fruit for God, but wanting to do our own thing and not abiding in God, then God will let you go on. He won't make you serve him. He won't make you ask things according to his will. The most important thing to us should be being in God's will, because you know Without a shadow of a doubt that if you're in God's will, everything else is going to line up. That's what the scripture means when it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. If you're seeking the kingdom of God and wanting to bear fruit for his kingdom, everything else, you don't have to worry about how it's going to be paid for. You don't have to worry about finances. You don't have to worry about where you're going to live and all these things. All of a sudden, doors will be open. But when we're walking down a hallway that we're wanting to walk down that's not according to God's will, those doors aren't open down there. We have to open those doors. We have to break in, have to pick the lock, do all of these things. But when you're walking down a hall that God has for you with all these different doors, they're automatically open to you because God wants you to walk through those doors. In other words, he wants you to bear the fruit that he has called you to bear. Go ahead and keep reading. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. You so shall ye be my disciples. You see that? So how is God glorified? That we bear fruit, that we bear much fruit. You see that? Not just fruit, but much fruit. Let's jump down real quick uh, to verse 15. Let's keep reading there. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord do. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now, isn't that good that God is not so distant and not so far away that, you know, everything is just a secret? And I think many of us, we think of God in that manner. We think, oh, God is just some big God and his thoughts are so much above our thoughts. And that doesn't mean that God doesn't want to be a mystery to us. God wants us to know what his will is for our lives, you see. And so he's saying no longer do he call us servants, but he call us friends. In other words, what does that mean? That we have been accepted by God. One of the reasons that the Pharisees had a problem with Jesus Christ was because he made it known that he was the son of God. And so if you listen to them carefully and you read those scriptures, they accused himself. They accused him of saying, oh, you're making yourself equal with God. In other words, being on the same level. And so Jesus Christ had to come back and say, now, doesn't the scripture say that you have, be have become as God's? 
uh, that you are little gods. And exactly that. And that's what the scripture says in the book of Psalms, that we are little gods. In other words, God is not so much of a mystery. He's only a mystery to those people that are out of his will. But God, God is not wanting us to just walk around and just guess everything and just try to, you know, when we pray to God, he will let us know what his will is. And so here, this is a scripture that's let us know what his will is and that he's called us friends. In other words, he has accepted us as equals. Everybody understand? It doesn't mean that we are God or that we will ever be God. It just means that God talks with us. Uh, in, the, in the book of uh, Numbers, in the 12th chapter, when it talks about when God himself is speaking about Moses, He's saying that I have talked with him face to face. Now, Moses has such a relationship with God until Moses wanted to see God. And God told him, you can't see me. and You can't look upon me and live. So what I will do, is just get behind that rock over there. And as I pass by, I'll put my hand over your face. And I'll let you see my backside. And so when I pass by, um, my hand is going to be over your face. And then I'll remove my hand so you can see my hind parts. Now, you think about this. You... <laughs> You think about how good God is, you know, to say, you know, okay, you can't look on me, uh, up on me and live. Now, that's fan of us. You ain't, you're not going to see God as he is and live. But he cared so much about Moses until he said, but I'll let you see my backside. You can see my backside and live. God could have said, look, you hear, me, you hear my voice all the time. You see me in, in, the, in, the, in the bush, you know, as fire. What else you, look, just accept that I'm real and that I'm here and just do what I'm telling you to do. Quit being silly. But he didn't blow him off like that. Now, that lets us know what kind of friend we have in God. And, and I'm saying that to say this, is that Moses, God don't look at Moses any better than he look at us. It wasn't that Moses had any special privileges with God. Moses just sincerely wanted to see God and what he looked like, wanted to see his image and his figure and everything. And so God allowed him to see it. You see that? And so that right there should let us know what kind of God we serve. When we read this Bible, we should not only say, oh, that was good for Moses or that was good for Elijah. We should be thinking, you know what, God, if you use those men that way, if you answer their prayer that way, then you can do the same for me. Amen. That's what these men bore fruit for God. And we should be in a place. Now, see, the first thing we have to do is realize that we can bear the same fruit that we see these apostles bearing. Mm -hmm. That we can pray for the sick and they can be healed. That we can speak in tongues. That we can operate in the gift. The very same things that we see in this Bible is written for our, our admonishment. In other words, it's written so that we can know, you know what, God? If you use Paul that way, if you use Peter that way, if you use Elijah that way, if you used all these great men and women of God that way, you can use me the same way. Why? Because God wants to get glory. When we read the Bible and we read about all these good characters in here and all these people that God used, you know what? We should put ourselves in their shoes. We should say, you know what, God? I want to bear fruit the same way that they did. He might not use us in the same exact way, but God can use us for the purpose of reaching souls. And that is what, to me, what is all about. And so for us to do that, we have to realize who we are. We are his friends. Everybody understand? You're not his servant where he's looking down on you and cracking a whip over your back. You're his friend where he's telling you intimate things and secret things. He's confiding in you. And when you talk to him, he's not looking down on you as a servant, as somebody that, you know, here, idiot, take this paycheck and go on about your business because you're doing what you're supposed to do. He's looking at, it, at you as, you know what, we're cohorts and we're co uh, in, in the gospel. We work together. In other words, I'm going to work through you so that you can accomplish my will for your life. That is the way we should look at God. No longer is God sitting up so high to where we can't reach him. You know. And so for us to bear fruit, that's one of the things we're going to have to recognize. It's our position in him. Everybody understand? Because I want you to think about it. When a branch is bearing fruit and that fruit has become ripe and it has seeds in itself, you take the seeds out of that particular fruit and plant it in the ground and it, it will bear another tree. It will bring forth another tree. Everybody understand? All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Now, that right there should be one of the most confident scriptures to me in the Bible. Whenever the devil bring to me, you know what? You're a failure. Now, you know, I, just like I, I serve the same God that you serve, 
I have an enemy, the same enemy that you have. It's the devil. God encourages us to do his will. The devil's job is to discourage us and make us feel like we fail or that we're failures. And so whenever the devil bring to me this idea, you know what? You've made too many mistakes. You've made too many bad turns. There's too many people that think bad about you. You're not going to be effective. And look at how people have rejected you already. And that's just the way it's going to be from here on out. And even God don't want to deal with you because of the mistakes you've made and all of these things. Whenever the devil bring that to me, God bring this scripture to my remembrance. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. In other words, what does that mean? It means that before God chose you, he already knew about every mistake that you were going to make. And the people that have rejected you because of the mistakes that you made, it wasn't meant for you to reach them in the first place. God may have to send somebody else to reach them. They may have to hear somebody else's word or whatever because people are just going to be people and they're going to pick and choose who they want to receive from. But my job is to know that I didn't choose myself to preach. I had no desire to be a preacher. I had no desire at one time to be a Christian or to be saved. But God chose us. You see, and that right there to me is one of the most confident scriptures that he not only chose us, but he ordained us. Yes, thank you, Lord. That means he commissioned us. He didn't just choose us to be saved, but he commissioned us to do what we're doing. Whatever it is that we that he's uh, called us to do. He ordained us, uh, you know, and what does that mean? It means that <clears throat> while men may try to ordain people with natural papers, with physical paper. OK, I accept you as a preacher or whatever. That's all they can do is accept you. That piece of paper means absolutely nothing in the kingdom of God. Because I've seen many people get ordained that had no calling on their lives whatsoever. Yeah, everybody understand? There are many people that, that ordain themselves that want to be in the spotlight for whatever reason. But when God, let me tell you, I, I, am, I can make this clear and plain. When God ordains you, you don't have to go to some preacher and tell them that you call a preacher. You don't have to go to anybody. It, it doesn't matter who they, if they reject you or not. One thing those uh, Pharisees hated by Jesus Christ was because he was not of their order. In other words, he didn't operate in his in their little and function in their little crowd. He didn't try to get papers with them to show that he was a minister or anything like that. And they hated that. Why? Because God ordained Jesus Christ to be who he was and God operated through him, which is why they had a problem with him. They could not, and Jesus said, if you don't believe me, believe the very works. In other words, the works that you do will prove who you are. If God have sent you to do whatever it is that he called you to do, whenever you're doing it, people are going to know that the hand of God is on your life. And they cannot reject it. I don't care how much pride they got or how much they might dislike you. They cannot reject the fruit that God is operating through in your life. They cannot reject the very thing that they see. It would be as silly as me standing in front of an apple tree and trying to call it an orange tree. They're going to see the fruit of God in your life. And that's why we, we can't be concerned about what people think about us. If you know you're bearing the fruit of God, your fruit is going to prove who you are. And it doesn't matter what anybody else have to say about it. Everybody understand? And let me make this clear as well. An apple tree is still an apple tree even if you don't see apples. It just might not be the season for those apples to spring forth. And that is what get people caught off guard. They're looking at the tree while it's still being while the, the, the husbandman or the farmer is still working on it. And they're calling it and saying, oh, that's not an apple tree just because you don't see apples just yet. But every tree has a season that it brings forth fruit. And we as believers have to be willing to allow God to do a work in people on his time, in his time and in his own pleasure. Everybody understand? Because we have to realize that we belong to God in the first place. And so this is one of the scriptures that encourages me. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you to do what? That you should bring, go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain everybody see that that means that the things that you do for god last that the enemy don't come behind you and try to destroy it. now he's going to try it but that you bring forth fruit in such a manner that he can't destroy it why he can't destroy it if you abide in him that's what he's talking about that your fruit should remain that whoso that whatsoever ye shall ask of the father in my name he may give it to you so when our fruit remain, we'll be able to ask God for whatever we, whatever we desire, and he'll give it to us. Why? Because when you're bearing fruit from God and your heart is right, you're not going to ask for anything that's contrary. Let's pray. Let's ask God to help us to bring forth fruit. To bring forth, and not just to bring forth fruit, but to bring forth more fruit. My prayer is that we will pray and ask God to purge us and help us to bring forth more fruit. That is his desire. 
Let's also pray and ask God to help us to accept people where they are, even if we don't understand it and we might not understand whatever process they may be going through. We need to just know that God is dealing with people and that uh, he's dealing with people and in his own time and they'll bring forth fruit when it's time for them to bring forth fruit. That is God's desire that we bring forth fruit in this life so that people may see the good works and glorify God. And that's what it's all about is giving God the glory. If we'll learn this one, this one fact, this one idea to give God glory in everything. You know, we'll just praise God in everything, then God will give us more things to praise him for. And I think that's the bottom line when it comes to bearing fruit, is giving all credit and glory to God, and God will continue to work on us and purge us so that we can bring forth more fruit. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this word that you spoke to us this morning by bringing forth fruit. And God, we ask that you help us, Lord, bring forth more fruit, we ask, God, that you purge us with your word, that you will continue to cleanse us with your word, Lord. Remove anything in our lives that's not like you, that's keeping us, Lord, from bearing fruit for you. And, God, we thank you so much for the change that is evident in our lives. And may we never get discouraged, Lord, and may we never compare ourselves to someone else in thinking that we're not where we need to be, God. Help us, Lord, to stay focused on the task that you have for us. Not to look at other people and how fast they're running or the fruit that they're bearing, God, but to look at the way that you've changed us, God, because we know what we used to be and we thank you that we're not what we used to be, God. And we also give you glory, uh, Lord, in the growth that's taking place in our lives and that we know that we'll end up where you want us to be, God. We may not be where in, in growing, uh, we may not be full grown in every area of our lives, Lord, but we thank you for the growth process. And God, help us to be satisfied. Lord, help us to be happy in the state that we're found in now. God, so that we don't get discouraged while we're on this journey. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy that you extend to us while we're in this process of bearing fruit, God. And Lord, we have ask that you help us to extend that same mercy to other people, Lord. and Not to get so caught up in looking at other people, Lord, but just to focus on the task that you have for us to focus on and God we thank you for the word that you've preached God we thank you for the love that you've manifested to us and we thank you for being the true vine God and help us to continue to abide in you so that we can bring forth more fruit in the name of Jesus Christ we pray amen